Welcome to Trees with Don Leopold, Arbor Day edition. We're coming to you live on this Earth Day 2020 from the studios of ESF TV in Syracuse, New York. I teach the oldest and largest dendrology course in the country at SUNY ESF in Syracuse. Dendrology is the study of trees. If you'd like to know more about native and non-native trees, you might be interested in the 133 tree videos that Christopher Bakir and I posted a few years ago, and they're available free on YouTube. This is our third live Labor Day show, and I'll respond to questions and comments that came in this past year and questions that come in live during this broadcast. This year we have Audra monitoring the chat stream. Hello, Audra. Hi there, Don. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about where you're from and, and your major here at ESF? Yeah, I'm from the Catskills, a little bit over three hours away, and I am studying the Environmental Resources Engineering program here at ESF. We'll catch up with you uh, throughout the program here. So uh, Arbor Day is actually this Friday, and uh, Arbor Day is a holiday celebrating trees within a week celebrating the Earth. Arbor Day is almost 150 years old. And uh, happens to be that Earth Day uh, started exactly 50 years ago on April 22nd, 1970. I have a huge stack of uh, posts from people watching the videos over the past year. And there are some themes that uh, I'll address throughout the show here uh, in between any questions that come in. But I also wanted to answer a few or address a few comments that came in as well that I thought were particularly uh, memorable. And one of them has to do with uh, pronunciation of the Latin that we use in the tree videos because we give the common name and the Latin name. And this one was particularly um, an interesting post, and it was about the pronunciation of this scientific name, which is for the Don Redwood. And apparently the viewer, and I won't read his name, indicated, uh, he said it was a nice intro, the video, but I'll never understand you Americans and your problem with Latin. You're pronouncing the words like it is in English. You have such bad pronunciation that my ears bleed. So I, I'm very sorry that uh, it was so painful to listen to that pronunciation. Um, it isn't the easiest word to pronounce, metasequoia. Glyptostroboides, but uh, I generally have problem pronouncing a lot of words, not just Latin words. So thank you for that, that post. Uh, a lot of the, the, the posts, it's interesting because they're from all over the country and from other countries in the world. And it's really interesting to see that for trees that are fairly widespread, the really strong difference of opinion for some of these trees. And for example, I want to read you something about hackberry, which is not one of my favorite trees, but I, I like all trees. And this post was from two different people in two different places. And the one post was, one of my least favorite trees if you're in central Texas, referring to hackberry. And there aren't as many trees in East Texas because it's rather brutal growing conditions. And then not long thereafter, a post from Minnesota, which has even fewer trees because it's so cold. Hackberries are totally underappreciated. They're fantastic yard trees for the following 10 reasons, which I won't read. But it's just interesting. Um, I, I learn an awful lot from these observations, as we do as teachers in the classroom. You actually learn so much from students and their questions, and that's when you find out if people are really understanding what you're talking about or not. I did learn something interesting, probably of all the information from viewers. Uh, this was about Osage orange, Maclura pomifera, which is uh, a tree that's native to Louisiana, and it's widely planted. And it has a really distinct large fruit. It's, it's actually much bigger than what I'm holding. It's more the size of a grapefruit when it's uh, fresh, and it's bright green and it has a milky sap, and it's pretty disgusting uh, when, when you bruise it. And someone wrote in to say uh, that cows will eat the fruits, but it makes them slobber like crazy. So this is the first time in 40 years of studying trees that I've ever read or heard that. So keep that in mind in case you ever see a, uh, 
a slobbering cow, that it might be because they're eating Osage orange. So a lot of the questions that I get uh, from individuals that email me throughout the year are about identification. How do you identify some of the trees? The, the videos go into that in some modest amount of detail, but they're relatively short. And so a lot of what we do in dendrology is we, we talk about how do you identify trees? And of course, leaves are the, the basic uh, place to start. But before we get in, so I wanted to talk a little bit about oaks from the standpoint of identification, but also about common names. And someone wrote in to say that, why is it called red oak when, the, when my leaves are brown in the fall? Well, there's a number of reasons for that. First of all, red oak is a common name used for lots of different oak species that are related. And, and uh, an oak, uh, a species that there's, there's, a, there's a really distinct group of oaks that have, the leaves have bristle tips. And I hope you can see them on this close up here. But I have two different, they're both technically red oaks. One is the red oak, northern red oak, Quercus rubra. And the other is pen oak, Quercus palustris. So any oak that has a bristle tip is technically a red oak. And so different oaks have different fall colors. In northern red oak, which is right here, it can have a beautiful red fall color, or it can be a very beautiful chocolate brown, or it can be anything in between, and it can vary from year to year because of the conditions that affect fall color. So fall colors, uh, why trees, uh, there's, a, there's a genetic component, but there's an environmental component. And oaks are all over the place in terms of their fall color. There's a, another whole group of oaks that are called white oaks. In white oaks, and I just brought three of the local oaks uh, along for an ex examples, the white oaks are oaks that when you look at the, the tips of the lobes, there are no bristles. And they're different in a lot of other ways, but there's, a, 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 there's an oak called the white oak Quercus alba, and then there's all these other oaks that are also technically white oaks. And one of them is bur oak, Quercus macrocarpa, and one of them is swamp white oak, Quercus bicolor. So they're all technically white oaks. And white oaks have a really distinct type of wood from red oak. And one reason red oak is called red oak is because the wood of red oak has a slight reddish brown tinge versus white oak, which is not quite as reddish. And you might not be able to even see that color differentiation depending on the lighting uh, that you're seeing. And they're both very important timber species, but the really neat difference between red oak and white oak is if you take a piece of red oak, a cross section, so imagine this is a piece of log coming out of the tree. And if you blow through the end of it, you could actually, if I were, if I were, had smoke in my mouth, I could blow smoke right through the tree, right through the wood. And it's because these vessels, the straw-like structures that the water is translocated to the leaves in the summer, they're open. There's no plugs in them. But on, for white oak, and it's all white oak, not just Quercus alba, but bicolor and, and prinus and all the other white oaks, when you try to blow through it through the end, there's resistance because all of the vessels are plugged with tyloses. And the reason that's so important is it really determines the uses of red and white oak. So red oak and white oak are both used for furniture, for flooring, for those kinds of general uh, construction purposes. But when it comes to barrel making, and the barrel making for wines and for whiskeys and other delicious drinks, um, you can only use the white oaks because they have those tyloses, those plugs that prevent the wood from leaking. Where if you were to try to make a barrel out of red oak, it would, it would leak. Now both of them impart the great flavors upon toasting and charring to, to the, the great bourbons in the world. But uh, the, the woods really are distinct and so are all the other leaf um, traits, uh, the, the different characteristics. Uh, oaks can also be separated easily by their buds. And we spend a lot of time in dendrology each year. The students learn the trees only by their buds. In fact, the, the buds are actually more reliable than the leaves. 
And so right here I have three different oaks and the buds on every one of them are quite different. But I have black oak, Quercus volutina, and it's a very angled bud that's very hairy. I have northern red oak, Quercus rubra. The buds are smaller and they're, they're more rounded. And then I have the more blunt buds of Quercus macrocarpa, bur oak. Now one of the really interesting features of all oak twigs, doesn't matter what the species is, is that when you look at the cross section, when you make an angled cut in the cross section, and you probably won't be able to see this very well, um, you have a really distinct star-shaped pattern. And if you cut into the twig of any other oak, or of any other tree species, the pattern is usually rounded. But oaks and cottonwood are two of the few trees in the temperate world that have what's called a stellate or a star-shaped pith. Um, oaks also have a really unique feature as far as all tree species in that their buds are clustered at the end of the twig. Very few trees have a group of buds at the tip of the twig. And so when you see that, it's almost certainly going to be an oak. Could be pin cherry, but that's a different, different story. I also wanted to show you just how different some of the acorns were on these species. For example, for Quercus alba, for the white oak, the most important of all the white oaks, the acorn caps are rather small and they're quite knobby. And look at the comparison to another white oak, Quercus macrocarpa, called the bur oak. The acorns are so much larger. Now, the neat thing about the white oak acorns is that they germinate as soon as they hit the ground in the uh, fall. And that's a, quite a contrast to the oaks that are in this red oak group, where here are just two examples. I've got the, the very common northern red oak here. I'll just look, show you the cap. The cap is really the most important part for identifying a tree. And then here's the uh, comparison with the black oak, Quercus volutina. So when you look at an oak in the winter, if you can't reach the buds, you, the leaves are all mangled on the ground, you're not quite comfortable with bark, but bark is also a great way to identify the trees. Then you look for the acorn caps and you can easily separate all the oaks based on their, their acorn caps. So the whole, a, a good tree course would typically take you through how do you identify a tree, not just based on leaves, but the buds, the fruits, the bark, the form. And most importantly, once you start to get out into the uh, nature, you see these trees on certain sites and every, every tree species is on a very particular suite of environmental conditions, wet, dry, sunny, shade. And those conditions will often hint as to what the species might be. So that's just a little bit of a background on some of the basic um, identification traits of some, some of many oaks, and it's just a really interesting genus of dozens and dozens of species, both in the United States and in Europe. So Audrey, do we have any questions from any outside sources yet? So far we don't have any questions, but we do have a few viewers who have not taken dendrology for a couple years now. One is watching with her daughters, and um, she studied with us in 2001 to 2004. And then another viewer has not taken dendrology since 1994. Well, you, you know, I, I get to do the alumni walks every year now for, well, as, as long as we've had them. And it has been so much fun to have people who have taken dendrology, especially here. Um, originally, I used to get a lot of Dr. Harlow's former students. And then I would get a lot of Dr. Ketchlich's former students. And to have these students come back uh, 50 years after they've taken dendro and to see the pride that they have in, in remembering the trees and showing off to their spouses how much they remembered, it's, it is really one of the highlights for me uh, each year outside of the classroom. Um, it's, it's just a great, I don't know why you, why everyone wouldn't take dendro because you, you pass trees all your life. Why wouldn't you want to know what, what's in your yard, what you're walking by, what your dog is using, whatever. Uh, it's just such a, a very interesting topic no matter uh, what your background is. So. Uh, another viewer posted something that I wanted to address. Um, and they mentioned the bitter nuts and how, what good are they if you can't eat the nuts? And they're talking about bitter nut hickory, Caryocordiformis. 
And so what I did is I, I brought a few um, of the native hickories to New York, some of their nuts to, to show you the differences. But, but bitter nut hickory is a relatively small nut and it has a very thin husk and it has a really distinctive feature that tells us it's bitter nut hickory. But the key thing is, is that when you eat it, it's very bitter. So the common name is, uh, sometimes common names don't make any sense, but in this case, the common name is absolutely right on. It is very bitter. But hickories as a group are just really some of the most delicious nuts you'll find out in the, in the woods. And the more commonly known hickory is shagbark hickory. And there's no better bark to learn your barks to start off with. If you, can't, if you, if you think that, bitter, that shagbark hickory bark looks like all the other barks, then it's, it's probably hopeless. Um, so here's shagbark hickory, and it's a smaller nut, but it's delicious tasting. Now in the Midwest, this is a real common hickory and it's pretty rare in New York, but it's called the shell bark hickory or king nut. And it's called king nut because the nut is about the diameter of a tennis ball. And this has one of the most delicious tasting nuts of anything, one, one of the most delicious tasting fruits I've ever had. It reminds me a lot of, um, of, shell bar, of a uh, butter pecan ice cream without all the sugar. It is just really one of the very best tasting of all things you might find in the woods. There are some other nuts that uh, hickories, hickories also include pig nut hickory and red hickory. This is a pig nut hickory here and pig nut is also very delicious and it's called pig nut hickory because it was often fed to pigs. That's a very nutritional uh, meat inside. So the hickories are really, uh, other than bitter nut, they're among the most delicious of all nuts that you might, nut trees that you might find that are, that are naturally occurring. Uh, some other trees that are especially good for um, eating are uh, the walnuts, the black walnut and white walnut, which is also called butternut. Uh, pawpaws, one of my favorite trees because it's such a beautiful tree and it's so delicious tasting. A uh, pawpaw is a very common fruit of the uh, Midwest and it's also called the Indiana banana, a semina triloba, beautiful fall color, great looking flowers, nice form and it's uh, really a delicious fruit. It's about the size of a big uh, German sausage and it has a taste that sort of is a blend of vanilla, pineapple, custard, yogurt uh, taste. I uh, got a question? Yes, we do have a question. Okay. We are wondering if you have any tips for getting a Korean nut pine to make pine cones. So, Korean nut pine to make pine cones? Yes. So Korean pine, uh, Pinus coriensis, um, will grow. I mean, it, I don't know where this call is coming from, what area of the country, but it, it's more of a uh, sort of a temperate species. It, it won't tolerate, you know, the, the hottest conditions. You know, pines in general are from temperate regions. They're, they're not the most cold tolerant, although there are exceptions, and they're not the most heat tolerant. But they're generally from most of temperate the United States, uh, North America, Europe, and, and Asia. Um, pines in general, most of them do not produce cones until they're 20 to 30 years old. And there are exceptions. Jack pine is, is, will start producing cones as early as less than 10 years. Um, so there's nothing you can do. You have to have good growing conditions. And if the growing condition, if the tree is growing, then it's a matter of time for the cones to be produced. So there's, I don't know of any example where the tree grows great but the flowers aren't produced and the fruit aren't produced. Um, so in the case of, of a Korean pine, and, and the reason that, that this might be an important question to some people is that these are delicious tasting. A lot of pines have some of the most delicious tasting. They're, they're small, but it's the source of, of, uh, of what we make pesto out of, and that's from Pinus pinea, this, the Italian uh, stone pine. But there are other pines in the United States and in, throughout the world where the seeds are really highly desired. They're high, they're very nutritional. Pinion pine's the most famous from the southwestern United States. So I would say be patient. Uh, the, uh, one issue with trees that people sometimes have is that they want shade right away, they want fruit right away, they want, they want the shade right away, they want everything right away. And the, the trade-off with trees is that, you know, you, you might have to wait 10 or 20 years and it's often said that you, know, you plant trees for the next generation and the generation beyond. Uh, if you're looking for something immediate, that's, that's what annuals are for and, and other um, shorter lived types of, of species. But um, 
the uh, Korean pine is a, a beautiful tree, um, one of my favorite of all the non-native uh, pines, but um, it's just a matter of time. Cones should be produced. Okay. There is one more Audrey? if you'd like to talk. Okay, about. Audrey, I'll take another question. Okay, so uh, we would like to have you talk a little bit about blackjack oats. Oaks, sorry, they grow among the longleaf pines in Pinehurst, North Carolina. Blackjack oak is an incredible tree that uh, I think one of the first times I saw it was in the New Jersey pine barrens and the pygmy pines with pitch pine and it was only like five feet tall and it has this beautiful shiny almost black colored leaf that is top heavy. It almost is a little bit cross shaped but not quite as, quite as cross shaped as a common associate uh, Quercus stellata, the post oak. Jack, um, the, the blackjack oak, as you get further south, and we were doing some work in Mississippi a few years ago and saw some beautiful, big specimens. They were so big that I, I didn't think that they were blackjack oak. But it's, it's a, it is a, technically, it's a red oak. If you look really carefully at the leaves, you'll see some very small bristles. The bark looks like it's described as uh, alligator hide. It's blackish. They'll live for three or four hundred years, and there are few trees that are as drought tolerant. So you often find it with longleaf pine in the Carolinas, um, or uh, with long with um, other southern species. But it's really one of the very best oaks for the driest sites, and you get a hint of that from the leaves because the leaves are when leaves are real thick and real glossy. It's usually a, a set of adaptations that minimize evapotranspiration and allow the tree to survive on, on otherwise very droughty sites. So uh, blackjack oak in New York is, a, is exceedingly rare. It's only on the north shore of Long Island, the south shore of Long Island. Nowhere else, it's one of our rarest trees and I really miss seeing it more than once every few years when I travel because it is really one of the neatest looking of all the oaks. So thanks for, for asking about that. Audra, do you have anything else there? I think that's all we have for now. Okay. I was talking about some native trees with especially good fruit to eat, and I, I have to mention persimmon. Uh, persimmon is, uh, I mean, you know, raccoons like it, armadillos like it, but people like it too. It's just, it's one of the tastiest of all fruits. If you've never had a persimmon, imagine an overripe apricot that was soaked in honey for one or two weeks. And uh, it, there's just few fruits that are as sweet and delicious. It also makes a good, you can sort of make a, a, a persimmon pudding out of it. It's really just a bread, like zucchini bread, but you use persimmon pulp. And they're perfectly hardy. Uh, they're hardy way up in upstate New York. We actually have some really nice ones on our campus. And there's some that fruit down at the Cornell's uh, Ithaca campus that I visit at the right time every year because I, I miss eating those. Another really good tasting fruit from a native tree is a service berry or June berry. It's got a lot of different common names, but the, the genus name is Amelanchier. And to me, they, there is, they, they rival blueberries, uh, but they ripen about the end of June. And uh, it's hard to beat the birds to them because they're really a favorite of a lot of birds. But, um, and they're very easy to find. They're easy to find in the woods. They're easy to find in the, in the uh, nursery trade. There is a non-native tree that is very um, popular to eat during the uh, late uh, spring, early summer, and that's the white mulberry, which was planted here for the uh, silkworm industry, which never really took off. So we've got the tree, but uh, the silkworms aren't really eating much of it. But the white mulberry Morris Alp is a delicious tasting tree that you can find in urban areas. So it's, it's a tree that you might stumble on. In, a, in an old back lot somewhere, but the fruit is really, really delicious. So a lot of the, the posts that, I, that we get are about how much people like certain trees. Uh, but then there's posts that are like, how do I get rid of this tree? And one that often comes up, and it's um, the most widespread maple in all of the United States. It's in all 48 connected states. It's also the most widespread maple in, uh, in Europe and in Asia. So last summer I was in uh, Kazakhstan and Siberia for a couple weeks. Siberia a few years earlier and the most common tree other than scotch pine and European birch is Acer nagundo or box elder. And box elder, this is a single leaf of box elder. All right, so it looks like there's five, 
different leaves there, but that's a single leaf. And box elders has a leaf that's a compound leaf, and compound leaves are unusual for maples in North America, but they're very common for Eastern Asian maples. And one of the most common Eastern Asian maple that you might be aware of is uh, paper bark maple, Acer griseum. So it's not unusual for Asian maples to have three to, to five leaflets to make one leaf. Box elder is, is native to every state um, that's connected in the United States. But it used to be restricted to floodplains, and but now it's probably the most common urban weed throughout the United States. And what often happens is it, it will invade a flower bed, and somebody will will cut it at the base, and you've just sort of released the uh, kraken. Um, it, it sprouts at the base at a tremendous amount. And the more you cut it, the more it sprouts. It's called basal sprouting. It's a common adaptation that trees have when they're in, when they're, when they've evolved in a disturbed environment. And box elder is a naturally occurring floodplain species, so I suspect the sprouting from the base was a mechanism to so it could repair itself after flood damage in the spring. So you're not going to kill this tree by repeated cutting. There's no way you'll kill it. So your choices are if you if it's small enough, you, can, you have to dig it up. You have to dig it up from the root system. If, you, if it's too small and you need to get rid of it, for example, in the adjacent Oakwood Cemetery to our campus, there are a lot of box elders that are coming up adjacent to the headstones, and they're starting to push the headstones over because they will eventually win. They, they, are, they, will, they will push over anything that's in, in its way. So under those circumstances, you, you have to get rid of it. And so if you do want to get rid of a box elder, and you don't, you know, you know, you shouldn't go out looking to get rid of box elder. It's a, it's a it's a very functional tree in terms of wildlife and insects and ecological function. But if it's causing problems, you really have to resort to, to herbicide treatment. And I know that's often not a popular uh, suggestion, especially on Earth Day, when Earth Day really is a came about for people protesting the the degradation in the environment, but if properly used and properly applied, following the label directions, herbicides are a useful management tool for species that you have to get rid of. Um, but another viewer did mention, while one wanted to get rid of it, another mentioned how, how valuable the, the tree was, and, and it absolutely is, as all, all trees have a very important place in the world somewhere. Yeah, a question? Yes, would you be able to talk generally about the ecological importance of standing dead trees? The importance of standing dead trees? Yes. Oh my gosh, um, so when a tree first dies, the last thing you want to do, unless it's a health hazard, is to cut it because standing, there are so many organisms that, that use the tree. If it has a cavity and a lot of dead trees that are standing typically are hollow because that's what made them die in place. And so there are all kinds of birds, the swallows, that, that use these cavities. Um, there are all kinds of small mammals, uh, raccoons, uh, big mammals like bears that use tree cavities. Um, the, uh, a, lot of, a lot of different bat species will hibernate underneath the bark on loose bark species, um, uh, like the sycamore, sycamore and, um, and the hickories. So there's a tremendous value when the tree is standing for other organisms. Um, and when they fall, then they become important regeneration sites for certain species. There are certain species of trees, shrubs, and, and herbs that do very well on fallen trees. For example, there's one of my favorite places locally is a place called Nelson Swamp. It's 2,000 acres, the only place you'll ever see the uh, creeping uh, wintergreen uh, Galtheria hispidula is on a rotten log. If it wasn't for rotten logs, that species wouldn't even exist there. Um, rotten logs are also the, so important for salamanders and so many other organisms. So it's um, really important to not look at downed woody material, well, standing or down, as something you need to get rid of unless it's a health hazard, unless it's a, you know, something might fall on somebody, that's a different story. But uh, these are they're very valuable components. Architecturally, some of the neatest structures I've seen in, in forest, um, small and, and big, are uh, dead trees. In fact, seeing a, a, a dead standing giant sequoia 
as impressive as they are alive, they're pretty incredible when they're even when they're dead and standing. So very important uh, topic, and I'm glad that uh, someone thought of of, uh, of asking about it. Thank you. Okay, Audra, you got another one? Yeah, we just have a few comments here of people that have graduated from ESF. One comment is, I use my EFB knowledge every day as a K through 12 science educator, and while thinning the ponderosa pine on my property. And another one is, um, let's see here. I loved my dendrology classes with Dr. Leopold in 1994 <laughs> and 1995. Now living in the PNW, I, use, and I still use identification techniques. Thank you so much. Well, it's always great to hear from people who haven't forgotten ESF and, uh, and, and, and the tree courses. Um, I do get an awful lot of um, email uh, from, from alumni directly, and it's, it, it often happens on some of the gloomiest days when, you know, you just, you know, it, and there have been a few of those lately, so it's always great to hear from people. And um, the neat thing about trees is that uh, those who have taken dendrology at ESF know you, we only cover 84 species. That, that, that's only 10% or 9% of the trees that you'll find in North America. And so it's one of those topics that you can build on. And then when you start traveling to other countries, it's just so, um, it just makes it, the, everything seems so familiar when you can recognize a few of the, at least the genera. I was in, um, in Moscow a couple years ago, and the most common tree in Moscow was black locust, Robinia pseudoacacia, which is a southern Appalachian uh, native and very common in the eastern United States. And it was just in a place where I understood little of the language. It was all new food, all new drink, all new people. There, there's a... There's black, you know, I felt so at home by seeing black locusts. So um, it's, uh, I'm, I'm glad that people are still looking at trees, and, um, but there's, there's a, a lot more out there to look at if, when you have the opportunity. Uh, I mentioned Acer nagundo and, and, and how do you get rid of it because it basal sprouts. There's another tree that uh, someone posted about, and their post was tree of heaven, I call it tree from hell. How do I get rid of it? Well, tree of heaven, and this is a, a single leaf, so a single leaf made up of leaflets, but this is a single leaf from tree of heaven, and they're quite abundant in the eastern United States. Uh, they're often dominating in, uh, in urban lots, which very few other trees would, would live, and so I, I don't think I would necessarily want to get rid of it there, but if it's, if it's in a uh, park or in, a, in your landscape, this is another tree you will not get rid of by cutting it because this tree sprouts from the root system and there are a bunch of trees that do that. The sassafras, aspen, black locust, uh, black gum. You will not get rid of these trees by cutting them. What you do is you just make them come back with a, with a vengeance. And so in this case, for treating black locusts, or for treat well, black locusts is a serious conservation concern in, in New York in the Pine Barrens because it's not native, and it takes over our native native trees and the carna blue butterfly. So under those circumstances, you have to resort to not only a herbicide but a systemic herbicide, which again I, I'm, I'm aware of how unpopular they are in some some areas, but sometimes you have to weigh the consequences of not. Uh, treating trees under these circumstances because they could become more of a problem. So tree of heaven, like a lot of root sprouters, requires treatment with a systemic herbicide. Okay, Audra, you have a question? Yes. If the tree was killed by fire blight, an apple, or a virus, is it still okay to leave it standing? So there, those are two different things. Fire blight is a bacterial disease, and if you have other um, apples and cherries, especially apples and, and pears, so the, the group, it's, it's a group of trees within the rose family, the rosaceae, that are somewhat related. These are the, you know, the pears, apples, and cherries. If you leave, uh, if you don't dispose of that infected wood, you can cause problems on adjacent trees. If, it's, if, if everything around it is an oak or a pine or something that will never, under any circumstances, get uh, fire blight, then there's nothing to worry about. Uh, viruses, you know, there's some pretty serious um, uh, other ser the systemic diseases in trees. Um, most of them are really specific. For example, the uh, um, elm yellows and uh, Dutch elm disease are two vascular diseases of elm. 
if you've got other elms, you've got problems when you have those diseases. If you have any other genus, those diseases don't make any difference at all. So it really depends on what else you have around it. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're in a nursery setting versus a street tree setting versus a woodland setting where the diversity of trees would typically be highest, uh, there's probably nothing to worry about. Uh, sort of related to questions about tree health, uh, someone, another viewer wrote, uh, this is all he wrote, RIP black ashes. And he was referring to the emerald ash borer. The emerald ash borer came across in, from Windsor into Detroit, Michigan uh, years ago and has been responsible for killing 18 million ashes in Michigan and killing all the ashes now in the Northeast and into the Midwest. All of the white ashes, all the green ashes and all the black ashes. Blue ash, which is native to the Midwest, has some some degree of, of resistance, but it's not a perfect resistance. The, the only truly resistant ashes to the emerald ash borer, and, I'll, and, I, and I, brought my, I brought emerald ash borer. You won't be able to see these. There's about five. They're having a party inside this little vial of alcohol here. Um, they're, it's a very small insect. And when they're not in alcohol, they're, it's a beautiful bright green, looks like emerald. And they absolute, absolutely, um, absolutely devastate the, uh, all the ashes that are native. Um, so right now, ashes are being removed uh, for the most part, but like in Syracuse or in Onondaga County, the county that we're in here, uh, we have a big park that had like, uh, it's Onondaga Lake Park, it had like 4,500 ashes. And the, uh, the parks people decided to, to remove some and then to uh, leave others and treat them because you can treat individual trees. So there's, a, uh, there's not a lot of, of natural resistance that we know of yet, but we'll never see natural resistance if we kill, if we absolutely cut every single ash tree that is infected. So uh, it's gonna take some time for this to sort out, but what happens is that the ashes have seeds that live for 10 years in the soil, at least 10 years. And so with all the ashes that are dying, and in New York, the three ashes, green, white, and black, make up 13% of all the trees in New York State. There's a lot of ashes that are dying and there's even more seeds in the soil. Those will germinate, form new stands, and the emerald ash borer will come back and, and do a second round. But at some point, we should see some natural resistance. Uh, there isn't any really other good treatment. The only really treatment is a, is a systemic uh, application of insecticide, which has to be done every two or three years. It's kind of expensive. But um, in the meantime, we're, uh, ash used to be very rare, it used to be one of the rarest trees in the Northeast and it became very common as it occupied all these lands that were abandoned after agriculture, and it's going to become rare again, but it's, I don't think it's going to be totally wiped out. Uh, but in the meantime, baseball bats are shifting from ash to maple and, and, other, and birches and other woods, um, but in the short term, we have plenty of, plenty of wood for, for baseball bats. I, I wanted to update um, you on Dr. Bill Powell's work on American chestnut, a lot of the comments that we continue to get are about American chestnut. And if you look at something that's posted on ESF TV, uh, one of our conversations, I had an interview with Bill Powell uh, not long ago that summarizes his work on making American chestnut disease resistant. And he's done it. And right now he's waiting for approval from various federal groups to start planting the, these resistant chestnuts on throughout, the, throughout the, the natural range, which is the whole eastern United States. But in the meantime, I wanted to tell you that Dr. Powell recently received a $3.2 million grant from the Templeton Foundation to support experimental outplanting, which is what's going, right now we're, we're prepping sites and he will be planting this spring. American chestnuts under different conditions to see how well they'll do. These are the disease resistant American chestnut. The, and they're truly, fully American chestnut. Um, the neat thing is, is that he started all this work decades ago on American elm, which has two serious lethal diseases. And there's no resistance to both diseases right now, only to one, the Dutch elm disease. So now he's actually, while he's waiting for federal approval, he's starting to get back to looking at American elm disease resistance. 
So here he's working on the single most important tree in the eastern United States in the, in the eastern deciduous forest. And now he's turning his attention to the single most important urban tree in, in all of the United States and in Europe. So uh, what we're hoping someday is to have the financial support to create this tree restoration center so that we can, so he can apply these techniques to all these species that we keep on hearing about is one after another we're losing because of insects and diseases. And it's um, someday we hope to have this tree restoration center where we'll start tackling all of these problems and then not having to worry about these trees disappearing, at least in our lifetime. So, yeah, question? Yes, we have a viewer that lives in the Syracuse area and is wondering um, how they should go about planting pawpaw trees in their yard and what is their, your recommendations for successful establishment of this tree? So, so the question about pawpaw, um, pawpaw is, is actually native to New York, but it's up uh, in the Lake Erie region, uh, closer to Buffalo. So it does very well here. I've got a 30-year-old in my yard that I grew from seed. Um, it's perfectly hardy here. You do need to have more than one individual and ideally some genetic difference within those individuals. So the best thing would be to, you know, if you go to some companies like, for example, and I'm trying to advocate anyone in particular, but Stark Nurseries sell about 15 different pawpaws. These are the real thing, different varieties. So they have different fruit taste and different fruit sizes and all kinds of other things. Um, Pawpaw is an understory tree, so pawpaw shouldn't be in the deepest shade because you'll have less fruit production. But partial sun, partial shade, moist conditions, it's, it's a lower slope Appalachian species that is not found up on really poor and fertile dry sites. So you've got to give it good conditions. Uh, you, you have to be patient. This is not the fastest growing trees, but within five years, you'll start to see a pretty good fruit crop. And we've got them planted all over on campus and on some of our college properties. And some of the varieties that we're planting are really cranking out, I mean, over a bushel of fruit, probably a, a piece. They're easy to grow from seed. I've got a bunch of seeds in my refrigerator right now that are ready to come out. Uh, you simply store the seeds for a, uh, three months in the refrigerator, then they'll, they'll germinate pretty readily. But it's, it is really an interesting tree. It also root suckers, so you get these thickets of, of uh, trees if you want. But um, it is really one of the most interesting of all native trees and certainly one of the most delicious. It tastes like a subtrop it tastes like a tropical fruit. It's from a subtropical family, the Anon ACA. So it's not surprising that it's surprising that it grows here, but it's not surprising how it tastes. It is really one, a wonderful fruit. So great question though. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, we have one more. Would you be able to speak about the Trillion Tree Initiative put forward by the federal government and how it can be reconciled with the proper timberland management? The, the Trillion Tree Initiative? Yes. I, I've, you know, I've heard of the Million Tree Initiative in New York City, but I've not heard of the Trillion Tree Initiative. So was there, you have any other information there? No information yet, but if they get back to us on the chat, I'll let you know. Yeah, you know, there's, New York State in 1920 was 20% forest. The rest of it was abandoned agricultural land. Um, there, there's no reason for that. There's, there, New York State and most of the country outside of the most arid regions will grow trees. And why we devote space, empty space to plants or to nothing uh, is just inconceivable when trees have such an important ecological role. They do so much that's important for the environment. It's actually kind of neat that Arbor Day and, and Earth Day, Earth Week, they, they coincide because you, 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 you need trees for, for a healthy Earth and for the most part, unless you're talking about Antarctica. And so it's um, any, any opportunity to plant trees as long as they're not going to be problem trees, problem trees in terms of maintenance, problem trees in terms of invasiveness. And there's plenty of resources out there to make sure that the right trees get into the right spot. I do, I, I wanna make sure that we cover a couple things before um, we have to close. And one thing I wanted to cover is that Arbor Day is a celebration of trees. There are over 700 tree species native to North America. So I wanna mention a few that are especially amazing. And I brought in some, some props here, and I'll see if we can do this. Let's, um, 
Let's see how we can line this up if this will work, but I've got four cones here and they're all from the same state. I personally collected these. I climbed, uh, I climbed the tree for this one so I could cut it out. But it, I'm looking at the mod here to make sure you can see them all. Okay, so I've got four, four questions. And see if you, I mean, if you've taken dendro, you know, you know the answer to this, but all right, so one of these cones is from the tallest tree in the world. One of these cones is from the tallest tree in the world. Uh, the cone's falling apart. Okay, so it's, it's, it's actually this cone right here, all right? And I'm gonna put up the name. Here's the cone. All right, so the tallest tree in the world, Sequoia sempervirens, the coastal redwood. And if, you know, people are always asking me, what's my favorite tree? I mean. I know about 2,000 trees, and so what's my favorite tree out of those 2,000? This might, if I had an answer, this would probably be it. And I, this was reinforced last May. I spent a couple of days in the Stout Grove in Northern California where they filmed Return of the Jedi. And I, I've seen these before, but I've, there was something special about that stand. And if, if there is a favorite tree uh, for me, this, this would have to be it. All right, so that's the, from the tallest tree in the world, one of the smallest cones. Okay, so which cone is from the largest tree or the largest living thing in the world? Which cone is from the largest living thing in the world? Well, it's not what you think it might be, but it's actually, this is the cone from giant sequoia. Sequoia dendron giganteum. What a great name. Sequoia dendron giganteum only occurs in California, about 76 different locations in the Sierras, and fire adapted, fire dependent, in fact. And it is a spectacular tree, unbelievable to see. Yeah, I, I can't wait to see it again. It's been too long. All right, so which cone is from the tallest pine tree in the world? The tallest, all these occur in California. If you've not been to California, to, if you've not seen the most spectacular trees, you've got to go to California. Um, not only do they have these trees, but they also have the oldest tree in the world, the, the great bristlecone pine in the White Mountains. So the tallest, the cone from the tallest pine in the world is this one right here. This is sugar pine, Pinus lambertiana. And it's mostly a California endemic, but it does creep into Oregon, so it's not restricted to, to California. All right, and I have one, and then the last question is, which cone is from a rather unremarkable looking scrubby pine? This looks like, it, it's not very tall, it's not very pretty, it's not like Eastern white pine, which is so beautiful. It is kind of an ugly tree, and yet this is Pinus culturae, culture pine, which is very common in the mountains just east of Los Angeles. And uh, when, you, when you walk in a stand of these, you're, you're, you're looking up. Uh, it has, they have killed people when the cones have fallen, but it is a really, it weighs up to 10 pounds, and it would be brutal if, uh, if it fell on you. So we wanted to point out some of these trees that we often don't talk about, especially culture pine, because most people have never, never seen them, have never, never thought about them. Yeah, okay, so what I wanted, wanted to do one more thing is because we, we find ourselves with some extra time, perhaps, and I wanted to share a couple, a uh, few books, actually five, so I'll do, try to do it quickly, that I have found particularly enjoyable, and, and these recommendations came from, from colleagues, and I thank them um, for suggesting these. I, two of them, I, I had to give the books back, so I just, have the, I just have the cover, but the first one I wanted to mention, if you're interested in something to read, and it's tree-related, this, the Sakura Obsession is one of the most enjoyable reads of anything I've, I've looked at. And it's about this uh, British ornithologist, Collingwood Ingram, who became one of the world's experts on cherries. And the importance of his work is that he actually reintroduced some cherries to Japan that they were on the verge of losing. So it's a, really a book about the history of Japan and the importance of cherries to Japanese culture. And, Ingram's efforts to save the species and varieties. It is really an enjoyable read and uh, very much related to cherries uh, and, and, and trees in general. Uh, the second book, the reason I recommend the second book, and if, if, you're, if you're an ESF al al alumnus, um, 
As I read this book, The Plant Messiah by Carlos Magdalena, I, all I can think about is it's like uh, I'm learning. I know this person because I know our students. This is about our students. This is about the the passion and the and the motivation and sort of the naivety sometimes that drives people to do things that they need to do. Uh, and so I, I mean, I really enjoyed it for the for the plant issues or plant stories, but it was really enjoyed it because I kept on thinking about so many students that I knew that seemed just identical to this person. He should have gone to ESF. Uh, he he went to some other good places like the Kew Gardens instead. Uh, t another book that I'd like to recommend is um, this is I don't travel without this book. This is a book. It's actually three volumes. I just brought the Eastern Region. And it's written by a botanist who for 40 years took his family, I can, I can relate to this, to all of the national forests, 155 national forests. And his, all his observations are about, uh, as a botanist in, ge in geology, really likes geology. And so if you want to see the best examples of so many tree species, the 700 or so that are native, this book is so good at telling you where to go. The state for the national these are national forests. They're free. They're usually accessible. They're not that crowded. And just make sure you check um, websites to make sure that they're open because a lot of these places are are closed uh, currently. I have a quick question from Audra. Yeah, this is just an update on the Trillion Tree Initiative. So I'll just restate that question again. Um, just asking if you could talk about the Trillion Tree Initiative uh, put forward by the federal government and how it can be reconciled with proper timberland management. And the viewer said, the initiative is a global effort from the private sector to plant trees to balance carbon emissions. OK, so um, I, can, I can address the um, this idea of, of, uh, of, of, of harvesting trees. Um, almost every place that you harvest trees, trees grow back naturally. Um, that's, um, I mean, this, this is just a fact, and, it, and it's because they're adapted to fairly broad, large disturbances over hundreds of thousands to millions of years. So I did my PhD work down in Western North Carolina on a, at the Coweta Hydrologic Lab where the watershed was clear cut twice. It's pretty brutal, but the, the regrowth was pretty amazing in terms of the diversity, in terms of the growth rates. Uh, so when, when you cut, you can, you can plant trees uh, sometimes uh, I, I think it's uh, I think a lot of people don't really understand that you don't have to necessarily plant trees unless the area is so degraded that there's no seed bank there's no seed pool there's no seeds that can be dispersed but if you've got a, a forest that's been harvested that forest will regenerate um, and I, I mean ideally it's done by professional foresters and it's going to be done in a way that you're going to get maximum growth, maximum regeneration, maximum ecological function including carbon storage. And so um, there's, I, th I think there's, it, it's important to plant trees but also recognize that forests do regenerate very well if harvested properly and um, they're not at threat of being eliminated because of a forest harvest. Got about about six minutes left. If you have any other questions, I would cover two more books. Um, this one might resonate the most with with some uh, members of the audience. Um, this is not just about trees, but this is a really fun book. It's called *A Drunken Botanist* by Amy Stewart, and it's it's about eighty chapters that are all about two or three pages long, and it's about the plants that make the world's great beverages. So whether it's Whatever it is, uh, liquors, liqueurs, wines, beers, whatever, they're all made by plant, made from plants. And this book goes into those details. It is so much fun to read. It's actually inspired um, a couple colleagues and I are working on a, uh, on a, on a follow up uh, that uh, is going to be about uh, bogs, bourbon, and beer that we're, uh, we're hoping to have done in the next uh, few months. But uh, really, it's a, it's a great book. Very, It's well done. It's technically very accurate. But uh, in fact, our bookstore got it in uh, for my advice. It's one of the best-selling books in our, in our bookstore for some reason. The last book I want to mention is a book that um, came out a few months ago from Johns Hopkins Press. And this is a book that a colleague and I had worked on. Uh, it actually doesn't sound like it has anything to do with trees, but we have a, the introduction puts the context of all these wildflowers uh, it, relative to the natural forest in which they occur. So if you're in a black spruce swamp or if you're in a northern hardwood forest, it talks about the trees, the shrubs, 
and then the wildflowers that you would find. So it's Johns Hopkins Press, Wildflowers of the Adirondacks, and I'm hoping that uh, we can get out and start using these, these books uh, pretty, pretty soon. Audrey, do you have any other questions there? We have another comment from a viewer who commented before, and she has a 7 and 11-year-old, and her girls both said, can we go see him? I've always wanted to meet a guy like this. Oh. <laughs> and they wanted to thank you for the book recommendation. Well, um, you know, I, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of my grandkids now and how much I miss them and wish I could see them and get out in the woods with them. This is such a great time of year to, to, to be out. Uh, even with the three inches of snow that was in my yard this morning, uh, this it, it's it, it's it's so important to get out and to be reminded of 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 a lot of the world that is still intact and and just so wonderful. So um, I hope you'll send your send your kids to us. Uh, I'm hoping I'll still be here a few years from now. So. So uh, that's what we're going to cover for, for this year. Um, my thanks to, to Audra. Uh, Audra, do you have any other questions there before we wrap up? Or I think we are all set. Many recommendations that, um, let's see, right here it says, talking about your book, Trees of Central Hardwood Forest of North America. And then another recommendation for a future video would be on a wildflower uh, video to follow up with your book. And then if you have a recipe for May apple pie as we're talking wildflowers. So I've got a lot of recipes for, uh, for plants, um, especially for liqueurs that involve simply infusing vodka with a lot of different fruits. They're so easy and so good. Um, I've never heard of May apple pie. I've got a lot of good pie recipes uh, using all kinds of native plants, especially uh, chocolate, pecan, maple, bourbon. Um, but no, I've never heard of made at May apple pie. As far as videos, Christopher and I have talked for years about doing some videos on shrubs. Uh, shrubs seem to be a, um, uh, there's I don't know how many shrubs people think are out there in their, in their woods, but they're literally uh, over 100 different shrub species we could easily cover. And we might start doing that. Same with wildflowers. In fact, we were two, three weeks ago started talking about doing wildflower videos, and uh, then the snows keep on coming. I think we've had more snow in April than we had in March, and we didn't have a lot of snow this year, but it is really making up for it. It's just like every other week we're getting some uh, snow event. Uh, the wildflowers are fine, but it does make it less enjoyable to get out and have to look at flowers underneath a, a snowpack. So, uh, but pretty soon we should all be able to get out and enjoy the wildflowers, and maybe we'll work on these videos uh, soon as well. So, uh, I want to again thank Audra for for fielding uh, questions. Uh, this is we we usually have about five or six people involved with this production, but it's a it's a very small group this year because of the health concerns. Uh, I want to thank Christopher Becerra uh, and and Keith and ESF TV for producing this show today under challenging circumstances. Uh, I'm Don Leopold. I thank you for spending time with me today. So long from Syracuse.